Okay, hello everybody. It's uh, twelve oh two on on my on my watch, so perhaps we can get started. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'll I'll um, let uh, our dean Stuart Seidel uh, offer some welcoming remarks. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for this uh, very important panel discussion. This is part of uh, a dean series on uh, diversity and inclusion conversations, uh, each of the schools as part of a, uh, an effort to support diversity efforts and, and uh, initiatives that the spot faculty and students are sponsoring. We said we, we would each sponsor um, a speaker series uh, from our own school or, or a speaker event to be part of a series from our own schools. And uh, so far, the ones that, uh, the recent ones I've seen from College of Business and uh, liberal arts, uh, liberal arts have been excellent, and I'm glad that we can contribute to uh, as the next uh, presentation as part of this Dean series on uh, diversity and inclusion. Uh, one, um, this particular topic, uh, I find personally very interesting, the questions it's raising about diversity and inclusion. Um, at, at my previous institution, I joined Mercy here in July, I was one of the leaders on campus on bringing a lot of diversity training to the faculty and to students and the programs on campus and to lead lots of conversations and initiatives related to inclusion. However, something also started bubbling up uh, in opposition to some of these programs. Some people were saying that um, we were uh, creating an environment that was only allowing uh, pro-inclusion views, I guess they would call it. Uh, um, the, uh, educationists of, and, and learning higher education institutions are supposed to be uh, places that uh, embrace free speech and the exchange of free ideas. And that's something we value about higher education. Um, and also they're supposed to be places where people can learn. However, at my previous institution, in response to some of the initiatives I was leading on campus, a group of college Republicans went to the state house in Hartford and said that um, they weren't allowed to express conservative views on campus, that if they weren't in alignment with our, uh, our, our trainings and our ideas to try to make a safe environment, that they weren't welcome. I know one of the young Republicans came up to me and said, um, in my classes, um, when I tell professors uh, that I'm gay, I feel very welcome in the uh, class and, and I'm embraced. But when I tell them I voted for President Trump, they treat me like they don't want me in the classroom, that my views are no longer welcome. Um, so uh, that creates some concerns in terms of in, how do we make sure that we're, we're not making people with different political views feel unwelcome or like they can't express it. We saw recently a case in the news of a professor and a, a political science professor at another institution in another state um, who was critical of um, diversity efforts on campus and students were saying that professor should be sanctioned, but the university was saying the professor has a right to free speech. Um, and now we're also uh, hearing a lot about this idea of cancel culture uh, universities are also supposed to be places of learning, learning institutions where people can make mistakes. Uh, so if you have a professor or a student who says something that they didn't intend to sound like hate speech, but it is hate speech, should they be canceled? Should they be asked, kicked out? Should they be punished or should, be, should it be a place of learning? So when you have college students who are denied admissions because tweets are discovered that could be categorized as hate speech. Should they be, uh, should their admissions be rescinded or should they um, be brought in and be taught how their actions are hurtful or wrong? Um, and, then, uh, and then a lot of what we're talking about today, this balance between um, the free exchange of ideas and creating a safe environment, how much of this is a real issue or is it just sort of a misunderstanding or a, a lack of self-awareness around what is what is bigotry, what is prejudice, and where people need to be educated, or or how real is it? Um, 
I mean, one question I often raise with uh, students who complain that you can't be a conservative in this environment of inclusion and diversity, I've never seen a student being given a hard time for embracing the economic policies of Milton Friedman or, um, or for saying, I believe in low taxes and small government. It almost always revolves around this, uh, these diversity matters where someone says something in a class that makes other people feel unsafe and not included. So that's why I'm excited for this talk today that uh, I'm very grateful that Eduardo, uh, Professor Albrecht uh, helped put together. So as part of this Dean's initiative, when we, uh, when I said our school would participate, I'm looking ahead, Eduardo Albrecht here, who helped me coordinate this, and he brought together a group of brilliant faculty members who came up with this idea of a panel that I'm very excited to hear about. And I'm very grateful for you, uh, Professor Albrecht, for bringing together the bright minds from our school to organize these panels and bringing these guests you have with us today to help lead us through this discussion. Uh, and whether, um, uh, whether it's a difficult balancing act between fostering a safe environment for inclusion, but also allowing for the free exchange of ideas. So thank you so much everyone for joining us. And thank you so much, Eduardo Albrecht for putting this together with the help of the faculty from our school. Thank you, uh, Dean Seidel. And thank you to everyone for joining us uh, for this event. I would like to spend a minute introducing speakers and then after that introduce a bird's eye view of an anthropological perspective of the main issues and challenges facing us when we consider the topic of diversity of thought and diversity of cultures. But first, our distinguished panelist. S. Kent Butler is a professor of counselor education at the University of Central Florida. His, re his research interests lie in multicultural counseling, group counseling, and school counseling as they relate to African-American males, spirituality and ethics in counseling, and diversity and social justice in counseling. In February of 2020, Dr. Butler was elected as the 70th president of the American Counseling Association. Rebecca Matis Pinard was named Chief Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Officer at Marymount Manhattan College in August 2020. She was a founding member of the MMC President's Advisory Committee for Diversity and Inclusion, while also establishing, establishing a first-generation student program. Prior to this role, she was the director of the Higher Education Opportunity Program, where she worked to support New York State students from academically and financially underserved backgrounds to access higher education. Originally from Queens, she speaks four languages, English, French, Spanish, and Creole. Albena Asmanova is Associate Professor of Political and Social Thought at the University of Kent's Brussels School of International Studies. Her research centers around social justice, political judgment, and modern ideologies. Dr. Asmanova has worked as a policy advisor for the United Nations, the Council of Europe, the European Parliament, and the European Commission. Her latest book, published in January 2020, Capitalism on Edge, examines tensions within contemporary capitalism that could set off radical transformative shifts. Today, we will address a tough question. Can diversity of thought coincide with diversity of cultures in the classroom? We will address this question, though perhaps not completely nor satisfactorily answer it. It may in fact not be solvable, as it is a tension, or rather a dilemma, that we have inherited from an empirical past common to all cultures and the imperfection of all peoples. This dilemma is twofold. It is psychological and it is political. Psychologically, we seek fellow humans that are like us and that agree with us. And we base that similitude on faith, not evidence, but faith, since it is impossible to know what another really thinks in the intimacy of his or her mind. The more our societies diverse culturally through the natural ebb and flow of migration, the global push and pull of poverty and opportunity, and the immediate availability of various foods, music, and ways of thought from all parts of the world, the more the need for that faith and similitude rises. We require more and more expressions of similitude from our fellow humans those expressions thus become ritualized and they become performances we expect to see and be pleased with. This alleviates anxiety and discord, 
momentarily, but at the cost of diversity of expression, performances that do not adhere to a standard that are seen as a bit off or perhaps insincere invite opprobrium. Factions rise where subgroups are seen as better performers of similitude. Society is thus splintered politically, culturally, and intellectually. We break off into echo chambers, echo chambers, echo chambers while inhabiting the same physical space. In and out groups become more clearly demarcated. Out groups are essentialized as fundamentally flawed. A person's entire moral character is based on just one aspect. We fail to see the person and the context, only looking and judging them for that one opinion we deemed distasteful. In sum, the more we diversify, the more our anxiety increases, the more we seek expressions of similitude, which pushes us into a frustrated and frantic search for even the slimmest signs of that from smaller and smaller sub-identity groups. This malaise affects everyone, irrespective of political beliefs or ethnic heritage, and irrespective of geography and history. In some historical circumstances, it becomes statist and institutionalized. One faction enlists the power of the state and public institutions to enforce the rituals and performances of similitude and to ban difference. Those that disagree have one choice, acquiesce or face sanction. We are all to some degree acquainted with the feeling that results. It is a cognitive dissonance a human being endures when asked to splinter their public persona from their private beliefs. It is the ultimate tool of power because it targets and reigns in the freedom of the human spirit. History indicates that this makes people grumpy. There are some that do not wish to let go of what to them is transcendent, immovable, and not relative nor subjective they may resist. This takes us to the second dilemma, the political dilemma. For the state and public institutions do have a role to play in monitoring and sanctioning discourse. The state has a responsibility to protect vulnerable sections of the population from harm. This is the rationale for banning what has been termed hate speech, speech that has the criminal intent to mobilize one section of the population to commit acts of violence toward another section of the population. This speech is and should remain illegal. Institutions of higher education also have a responsibility to combat this type of speech. This type of diversity of thought should not be allowed. That much we can all agree on. The hard work is engaging in a conversation over definitions, over what to include and what to exclude from the list of harmful and thus illegal expressions of thought. It becomes a question of defining the type of hateful expressions that are likely to result in criminal, intentionally produced harm. There are two challenges here. First, hate is after all an emotion and emotions are notoriously hard to pin down. Moreover, these emotions are often communicated via symbolic imagery and symbols, which both conceal and reveal are slippery to define identifying intent becomes difficult. The second challenge is what happens when this responsibility to protect becomes a tool of power. In other words, what happens if it is hijacked by one group to the detriment of another? What happens if your simple act of existence becomes hateful and thus a public security issue? Does the state still have the responsibility to protect society against your very existence? This has, after all, occurred in our own not too distant past and is yet occurring today in many parts of the world. Identifying this type of politicization or rather weaponization of the responsibility to protect is certainly easier in hindsight and when geographically removed. In sum, on the one side, there is a need for state and public institutions to stop the expression of thoughts that can be dangerous to people. And on the other side, there is a need to allow the expression of thoughts to stop the state and public institutions from also becoming dangerous to people. This is the political dilemma that is layered on top of the psychological one already discussed. It is a double quandary that as educators and institutions of higher learning, we cannot avoid or ignore. While we may not be able to solve it with the help of our panelists, fellow faculty, and all of you that have joined us here today, 
perhaps we can think of ways to mitigate its effects and perhaps build bridges that allow us to have both diversity of thought and diversity of cultures. I should like to now um, allow Professor Albena Asmanova to have the floor. Albena. Thank you. Um, so let us see where we are. The more diverse universities become, the more likely it is that free speech will offend some by chance or by design, destroying the climate of trust that is essential for learning. We seem to be trapped in an awful dilemma, free speech or safe speech. If liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. Thus wrote the English writer George Orwell in 1945 in an introduction to his book, Animal Farm. This book has very interesting biography because that introduction was so controversial that it was published only in 1972. In it, Orwell confessed how hard it was to get the book published. In 1940s, English intelligentsia held Stalin, uh, the, the dictator of Soviet uh, um, uh, Union, in high regard. So a book like Animal Farm, which was a thinly veiled attack on the Soviet Union and its dictators, was untimely. The book was rejected by four publishers who were afraid to expose themselves to public scrutiny. One of them said, I think the choice of pigs as the ruling caste will no doubt give offense to many people and particularly to anyone who is a bit touchy as undoubtedly the Russians are, he said. Well, while the public sphere has historically been somewhat hostile to contrarian opinion, there has been one place stubbornly free of this danger, the university. At the time that Orwell expressed his fears about the loss of intellectual freedom in the West, the American Association of University Professors adopted an important document known as the 1940 Statement of Principles on Academic Freedom and Tenure. The document stated, institutions of higher education are conducted for the common good. The common good depends upon the free search for truth and its free exposition. In 1970, a comment was added to this text, which is you know, very interesting, explicitly stating that controversial speech should not be discouraged. To quote, controversy is at the heart of the free academic inquiry, the document stated. Now, since its dawn in ancient Athens, <clears throat> academia has been the bastion of the freedom of thought and speech because of the conviction that unconstrained intellectual freedom is the engine of both scientific advancement and societal progress. Importantly, freedom of speech has been a weapon for fighting oppression from two directions, central authority and public opinion. Thus, John Stuart Mill famously observed in the 19th century that the chief threat to free speech in democracies was not the state, but the social tyranny of one's fellow citizens. Beautiful. This is what Orwell was alluding to when uh, he uh, decried the general weakening of the Western liberal tradition, as he put it, by controlling the opinion of enlightened people in democratic countries. However, the university has consistently been a fortress sheltering the freedom of speech from both prevailing public opinion and from the intrusion of political authority. And yet, something has happened over the past decade. In a curious shift, universities are transforming into spaces for safe speech rather than free speech. College campuses in the US and Europe have experienced major student protests 
as some students feel that absolute freedom of speech on campuses promote hostile environments that harm minority students and hinder their ability to learn. They have argued compellingly that denying hateful or historically privileged voices a platform is necessary so that the marginalized and vulnerable can finally speak up. They're demanding censorship and prohibitions against giving offense. We have created safe spaces in which offense or disagreeable speech is prohibited and punished. Cancel culture, deplatforming, codifying protected categories of students, this is now part of university life. The equal respect agenda is enforced through disciplinary and grievance procedures and safe space marshals patrol events for macro and micro aggressions. Is this the end of free speech in the university? I do not think so. We can resolve the deadlock between safe speech and free speech if we remember the original mission of free speech. I mentioned it already. It was not meant, free speech was not meant as a tool of information, but one of liberation. It was conceived as a political weapon, a weapon against the oppression of dogma and the abuse of power. To quote again George Orwell, freedom of speech is a right to express one one beliefs to be true without having to fear bullying or blackmail from any side. Exactly because the original vocation of free speech is to fight dogma, we should not transform free speech into dogma. And to ensure this, we must consistently use it as a tool for fighting oppression. Whenever speech is used to oppress, to bully and humiliate, it is no longer free speech, as it violates the very spirit of, free, of the concept. So this means that the grievances of those calling for banning offensive speech because it deepens existing injustices are valid. Admitting this, we have made the first step in breaking the deadlock between free speech and safe speech. The second step is to find the right way to respond to these grievances. Now, the gut reaction has been to censor offensive speech from banning the use of certain terms as forms of microaggression, for instance, addressing women as guys or to banning controversial speakers. But these, and I'll admit, effective short-term solutions incur long-term costs. And these costs, in my mind, are five types. Let me brief, briefly go through those. First, when we exclude some views from public debate as being dangerous and unsavory, we miss the opportunity to rigorously contest these views. They will, however, thrive in private, safe spaces, safe for them, and will continue to poison society. Second, civil rights law prohibits discrimination based on seven characteristics, skin color, religion, national origin, sex, disability, and familial status. And we are adding new categories. On this basis, school regulations often codify the protection of groups identified in terms of race, religion, gender, etc. Even as the number of recognized identity categories proliferates, this apparent increase of cultural diversity does not foster a culture of diversity. Professor Arjuna Padurai many years ago very powerfully drew the difference between cultural diversity and culture of diversity, and I am um, stealing this um, from him with that tradition. So the designated collective identities that we're creating in this way, entrap individuals into boxes of belonging, which deepens divisions in society. Cultural identity becomes a prison, not despite 
but through the effort to allegedly protect that culture. This brings us further away from the ultimate goal of the fight against discrimination, the pe that people be judged not by the color of their skin or their gender, by, by the content of their character. You know who I'm quoting. When the third danger, the third cost, when sheltered in this way, packed in categories of protected groups, students are infantilized and develop the habit of being patronized. They fail to learn the skills to stand up and defend their positions with solid arguments. Malcolm Max was right to say, if you have no critics, you'll likely have no success. The fourth cost, of safety. Efforts to replace free speech with safe speech open the door to autocratic rule. There is no limit to what any individual might define as disrespect. Who is to decide what exactly is to be protected? And so we pass the judgment to administrators and hand them the keys to discretionary power, exactly what free speech was born to fight. And finally, the fifth, the biggest harm of all. The policing of unwelcome speech eventually generates self-censorship, which nurtures intellectual cowardice. This is the foundation of a totalitarian outlook and the ultimate blow to freedom. I'm in a very good position to be saying these things because I grew up in a society in such a society in my native Bulgaria um, and fought against this oppression by joining a dissident movement against the dictatorship at that time. And the worst of it was really this self-censorship that you ban yourself to think. So we need to bear in mind that in our times, the enemies of freedom of speech are twin sisters. The bigot who attacks vulnerable minorities and paradoxically, the militant who tries to protect those minorities. Strange times indeed. Is there an alternative? Yes, I believe there is. Let us remember that the original purpose of free speech was to empower the weak, not to shelter them. The university therefore should be this place of empowerment. Here is what we can do. First, we can give tributes to risky speech, to bigotry, in order to expose it via rigorous questioning. Even those op though all positions have the right to be heard, not all deserve equal respect. So the fact that we're giving somebody the tribute doesn't mean that we're respecting them. Respect is gained through argument, through convincing, not granted. We need rules about the conduct of debate, but should not, never prevent speech that is lawful and the, 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 the issue of the lawfulness uh, of banning hate speech is, is, is a very different issue. So within the boundary of law, we should allow controversial opinions. Second, the second thing we can do we should abstain from placing people into the rigid boxes of collective identities. We should speak not of identity, but of a sense of self that is multidimensional and constantly changing. That is, we should build a culture of diversity, not diversity of cultures. Third step, we should be equipping students with the knowledge and skills to create a type of society that does not generate inequalities and exclusion. A type of society that does not create victims in need of protection. This plan is a more difficult road to take than imposing prohibitions. Albina, may I ask you to- We can begin. Including thoughts? Last sentence. Thank you. We can begin with one easy step, but by proclaiming our right to be challenged, the right to say with Voltaire, I detest what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Thank you. Thank you, Albena. Um, Dr. Martucci, would you like to introduce our next speaker, please? Yes, hello everyone. So 
Um, the next speaker is Rebecca Matisse Pinard, and she has been facilitating a workshop on racial equity that I have been participating in this fall. And the content of this workshop has been so useful in my thinking about equity and the way that I approach teaching and classroom inclusion and supporting my students. And so I was really looking forward to uh, bringing her here today and inviting her um, to be on this panel at Mercy. Rebecca is going to talk to us about this idea of diversity, which has become such a buzzword in many industries and institutions and especially within higher education. As with any word that is overused, we risk diluting the meaning of it and its impact on social justice or equity. And so Rebecca is going to invite us to interrogate our usage of the word and to think about its historical contexts. She argues that without critically examining the concept of diversity, that we end up co-opting it or we risk co-opting it and focusing on outcomes without thinking about the process of creating diversity and what that means. Um, so. Rebecca, it, the stage is all yours. Good morning. Oh, I guess good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, thank you for the invite. I'm, I'm glad to be able to speak to you all. Uh, Dr. Asmanova, it was really great hearing your thoughts about this. And, um, you know, I, I, what I really enjoy about this is, you know, very often do we get a space to really talk um about our different perspectives and to hear the different perspectives that people share and have that space created for that so um, i'm grateful to have the space and, and to share and dialogue in that way um, when i was asked to be a part of, of this panel and, and told to kind of give an introduction of what i would talk about I, I i didn't actually know and then i saw the title of this discussion and i was like oh we're talking about diversity of thought okay i didn't think we were going there and i'm not gonna lie it triggered me a little bit Right, and, I, and the reason it did is because I think um, as we talk about as we talk about diversity, I think sometimes there are these scapegoats to say that we're talking about diversity without talking about the real issues that are at play. So kind of like the introduction that, that Sarah gave, um, we, there's this expectation in industries that we have to talk about diversity, right? And if we don't talk about it, then we are not, we're not gonna be able to compete with other industries, right? It's the thing that we have to do. And unfortunately, there's been so much focus around it that we don't think about what it really means when, when we say diversity. And diversity has become a euphemism, unfortunately, right? We, we use it to talk about the outcomes um, of oppression, right? And oppression in the form of racism, sexism, homophobia, right? Um, any, any type of ism that you could think of. But oftentimes we don't like to name it. And we don't like, like to name the harm that's been caused by, to, towards marginalized communities and which norm groups got to benefit from the harm that was caused upon these communities, right? So diversity becomes this all-encompassing all term that everything falls under. Um, and so when I hear the idea about diversity of thought, I also find that that's an opportunity to not really talk about a major issue and think about higher education's role in terms of disparate outcomes of students, right? Of students as, as we look at uh, the disparate outcomes as it relates to race, right? Retention rates that are not equal across race, um, the amount of debt that students are, are taking out, right? Black women being the, the, the groups that are most in debt in higher education, right? And we don't look at the legacies, the historical legacies and socio-political climates that have an impact on these outcomes. But we say that we want to see more faces of color and we're not examining what's, what are the barriers that are even causing that to happen? What are the barriers that students are facing before they come into institutions that require them to feel nurtured and safe in these spaces to even be able to make it through and graduate? Right? So when we are talking about diversity of thought, does that thought have an impact on other people's experience? Is this thought exclusionary and harmful in a way that it does have an impact on those greater outcomes of retention rates right? and the sense of belonging? Um, over the years, colleges have taken on this space of being a second home. Right? Uh, for, for many of us, where we, went to where we went to college, where we went to, went to grad school, our alma maters, oftentimes we have a sense of pride or we wanna be able to have a sense of pride in where we went, 
right? You, you, you find someone else that went to the place that you went to, you feel a kinship. And for students that enter our institutions, we want them to be able to feel a kinship with these schools. And that does mean creating a place that feels like home, where they feel connected, where they feel safe. That essentially is what home is, right? A place where you can feel safe and feel like you can show up as yourself. Higher education institutions do have a particular responsibility in creating those spaces because we do know that in so many spaces in our society, not everybody is, is, is made to feel welcome and is made to feel at home and is made to feel like they have a space in that way. As institutions integrated around the 60s, what hasn't happened is looking at these institutions that were created and thinking about who created them, who created the curriculum, who created the policies, who created the pipelines. And so while diversity changed in terms of who we're allowing in, policies did it, right? Thinking about what we're teaching and how we're creating the sense of home didn't change. So this idea of free thought that existed, how does how does that how is that also supposed to shift when the um, the demographics of your population are also changing, right? And so that's one of the things that we have to think, take into account that when diversity of thought exists in a homogenous society, it can look one way, but as your demographic shifts. And we have people that have endured a legacy of oppression, right? That are part of subcultures, not because they want to be part of sub subcultures, but they are forced to be part of subcultures because of marginalization, right? And where these subcultures are not seen as the norm and seen as othered, how does diversity of thought impact how students are able to see themselves in institutions? Institutions that are supposed to be seen as a second home and a place of kinship and a sense of pride, right? We have a really important role to play as higher education is, is one of the settings that we're developing future leaders from multiple industries that are gonna shape other industries in our society to have an impact on larger societal forms of oppression, right? And these social structures. As we welcome students in, students are following our lead in terms of how they're gonna be leaders in their own industries. And how we take the lead in terms of developing specific policies, specific spaces so people don't feel harmed will impact our larger societal culture, right? When we even think about these, these type of programs where we talk about diversity and we come together and these are kind of co-curricular kind of programs, the reason they exist is because they're not embedded in the curriculum, right? This is an add-on to often curriculum that is more Eurocentric leaning. Policies that unintentionally have an impact, a disparate impact on um, being more beneficial to white students, students from well-off uh, affluent backgrounds, students who uh, come from families that have gone to college beforehand, straight students, right? So we, we have to think about all of this in terms of our role when we think about diversity of thought and diversity of thought impacting policies and us taking the lead for students who are gonna be future leaders in the industries that they go into, right? Higher education is, one of the, is gonna be one of the first places that they learn that impact. Thought leads to oppression. Thought can absolutely lead to oppression. Individuals impact policies. And so, yes, we do, we do have a very important role to think about where do we have a space for intellectual discourse, which I absolutely believe has to happen in higher education, right? Because when we think about the idea of safety, once again, we have this somewhat controlled environment where our instructors can lead classroom dynamics, where we can engage in this idea of difference where we, we, can, we, can, we can talk along those, like, those ways and make your argument and hear each other out. That is absolutely essential in higher education. It's, a, it's an absolutely essential tool for our students to, to, to use when they do go into other industries, when they go into cocktail parties, whatever it is, right? To be able to have that level of understanding. It is important to know that at what point does that diversity of thought lead to 
the continuation of oppressive thought, right? And harmful thought. And thinking about how can some of these things be dog whistles, right? Where we know what are the thinly veiled uh, messages that are being said with certain forms of thought, right? And really having to, to, to understand that and guide the conversation in that way. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm excited to, to continue to engage in this conversation and think about the different ways in which we, we manage it and really thinking about higher education's unique role in terms of how we balance the two and make sure that our students feel safe so that we can fight disparate outcomes in access to education and eventual outcomes in, uh, in professional attainment. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rebecca. I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Simmons now to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Eduardo. Um, I'm happy to be here today. Uh, my name is Jack Simons, and I'm going to introduce Dr. Kent Butler. Um, Dr. Sylvester Kent Butler um, is welcomed um, today. Uh, we're grateful that he could join us. He's very busy. Presently, he serves as interim Chief Equity, Inclusion, Inclusion and Diversity Officer at the University of Central Florida. I know his roots are, are deep, deep and wide in Connecticut. And when he was training me in Missouri, he was very clear about that. So I think it's quite fitting that he's here today, part of uh, our, pal our, our panel here in the Northeast, uh, which sort of ties him back to where he was developing his own skills to become a counselor educator. Um, he's now an expert in multicultural counseling and highly sought out. So I was very flattered when he decided he would come today and share his wisdom and expertise uh, with our students, colleagues, and others um, who are on the call today. Um, he's very flexible in his approach. Um, uh, I learned that early on with him as he was my advisor. Um, the flexibility in his approach to um, go near and far and use many words or few words to achieve his aims I believe makes him um, a valuable resource. Um, this is very important for all of us to strive to make the world more fair, just, and loving. Uh, as my former advisor at the University of Missouri <clears throat> in St. Louis, he trained me in both group and multicultural counseling, but it was in multicultural counseling really, where he really challenged me to examine my white privilege um, as a white male, to look at that more closely, to look at it as perhaps a hindrance to my own development and then encourage me, encouraging me along the way to facilitate discussions about this um, with other people. <clears throat> now as an academic myself, I, I, am, I see more than ever why these discussions are important um, across race, um, other identities as we've noted today, especially in the classrooms that we see are becoming more diverse in our nation and at Mercy College. Uh, so for that, I'm, I'm grateful and will always remain committed to teaching Dr. Butler's lessons to others, lessons that he's taught and he continues to teach me when he has time and he isn't jet setting around the, uh, the nation or the world. Um, Dr. Butler, I believe, models the importance of listening and sitting in and examining one's own discomfort when faced with differing opinions and values, sort of in that special space. The, this is often found at different stages or phases in life, depending on one's identity and path. Uh, many topics in the areas of diversity and inclusion may cause it to occur. And I believe at these times, it can be valuable to self-reflect, seek out feedback from others and possibly use resources such as journaling and assessments to remain mindful of the totality of one's experiences and importance of learning about diversity within oneself and communities throughout life. Uh, just a few more points and then I'll let him take, take charge. Um, a plethora of reasons exist, I believe, for um, the way people think, feel, and act or try to act the way they do. As a result, I don't think we should be alarmed that we have conflict that continues to be an integral part of the change process within us and others in society at large. Um, I've come to believe that at the root of this tied to trying to give more voice to those who've been historically marginalized and not having had their needs met in education or looking at um, agency attitudes and identity. We clearly know that when these things are compromised, it can compromise motivation, uh, lead to burnout um, and compromise academic success. 
So learning is no longer fun in the face of minority stress. Uh, nevertheless, do Dr. Butler supports advocacy, helping, helping, helping oneself and others in life. I hope that as we continue to tease out how to become better helpers, that we will continue to talk about how personal agency and personhood set the stage for more effective conversation, pedagogy, and social justice. Having Dr. Butler here today to talk about this and other topics is part of this important process. I'm delighted that my colleagues and our dean have supported this. I'm delighted to have you here today, uh, Dr. Butler. It's a true grit, too, true grit, too, too, true gift um, to have you here today. So. Uh, without further ado, I welcome uh, uh, Kent Butler. Uh, and so I, I would start off by saying that it's probably quite possible that I don't need to say anything else because um, I'm, I'm humbled by your words for sure. And I thank you. I, I, I come to you greeting you all this afternoon, um, saying hello and, and, and hoping that you are in good spaces and that you are listening. And that's part of what I think becomes really the jewel of what can happen in our cultural classrooms and that we listen to one another actively and recognize that each of our stories have value. And so I wanna come from that perspective and I wanna talk about dehumanizing or finding a way to humanize us all um, when it comes to diversity and diversity of thought. And so, I appreciate you sharing those things, Jack, um, and letting me know um, maybe what the impact was. Because every day I recognize myself and I want you all to recognize it as well. I am an African-American male and the world treats me as such every single day when I go out and I'm about, and doing the work that I do. And so when I'm in the classroom or I'm in front of you all, um, I have to speak my truth. And, and that comes with a cost sometimes, but it also is something that you grow into. By nature, I am an INTJ for any of you all who are um, familiar with the Myers-Briggs. And so um, as an introvert, I find my way, my way to be more extroverted and to come out and speak in front of you all um, with regards to how I see the world, and, and why it's important to do so. I have an eight-year-old daughter and, um, and since her birth, it has become even that much more of a mission for me to, to, to have my voice out there because I want this world to, to recognize her and her beauty and her gifts and her intelligence and not to kind of give her the types of pressures that I know that our youth are having and I know from our past um, many of my ancestors and people who have come along the lines um, to this stage, to this day, um, have had to experience. And so uh, it's really important for us to recognize that in order for us to have these conversations, we have to become real. And I want to read to you um, something that I came across right around the time that I met Jack, actually. Um, I was asked to do a conversation like this around diversity and inclusion around middle school students who are fighting with regards to um, students who are being bused into a white neighborhood and they couldn't get along. And so the conversations that were necessary and needed at that particular point in time was one in which they understood who they were, that self-knowledge, that understanding of who they were so that they would not fight against others who did not look like them. And so the, the story goes like this, or it's, um, it was by an author by the name of Jacqueline Duvall, and she wrote a book called Reckless Appetites. And I came across this passage and it says, if you ever contemplated revenge, beware of where your thoughts might lead. Understand how passion makes you strong, but know also when it renders you weak. What acts of wickedness would you inflict on someone merely because you did not get your way? Before you embrace vengeance, remove yourself from your selfish interior life. Go outside and walk and observe and learn from the world. There is artistry and solace in everything and everyone. Let them feed you. Learn how to harness your passions. 
your appetites. Consider how you might perfect the art of living. And so that passage is what I use every time I go out and I speak and I talk about diversity and inclusion and what equity really is. And it becomes really important for us to recognize that. And so when I, when I speak, I, I want you all to know that it comes from my heart and I want to hear from your heart. And I want to listen, I want to actively listen to the stories that you tell. So when we talk about free speech, free speech affects my life every day. Free speech goes into the policies and into the types of guidelines that are placed in front of people um, on a daily basis. And so with that free speech, it becomes really, really important that we have people at the table who also have opportunities for free speech. That inclusion, that inclusion alone allows the multiple voices to be in a place to help make changes in our society where everybody, every single last person is equitably given the access to all things that we should all have. So when we look across the world, what has happened in Germany, what has happened to our Jewish brothers and sisters, what has happened to our transgender uh, individuals who are walking in this world, what has happened to black and brown people, what happened here in our United States with Native Americans, we must always recognize that it was always because someone else had their free speech and governed it over the lives of people who were more marginalized or oppressed. And so we need to bring those stories into the room. We need to listen and hear and make good decisions based on that. So it doesn't just happen in our classrooms, it happens in our industry and it happens at our university for sure, right? So that when policies are being made, or when things are being said, it's taken into account all the individuals who may be affected by it. Now, do we reach every single last person with every policy that we make? No, we're not gonna make everyone happy, but we can do our best to ensure that those people who are out there have the opportunity to have access to the riches that everyone should have. I do not believe that there is one person among us who wants to live in poverty, but yet people are living in poverty. What is the reason why that is happening? I believe there's a systemic system that's in place that is there for hierarchical reasons to keep people in power and then make people have less power. We all want to have the luxuries of life. We want to live in a mansion on a hill or along the lakeside and, and have those beautiful things go um, to, our, uh, to help us to feel important or whatever it is that it is that we do. But I don't believe that people want to walk around in poverty or with food insecurities or with any of those other things that may keep them um, at bay from a, even a college education. And so why is it that we have those things? Well, the reasons that people who are in power don't want to listen to the voices of those who are marginalized is because it keeps them in their safe space. So we want to dismantle that. We want to break down the racist ties that help people stay in power and don't let but a few get through, um, if any, um, to, to be able to enjoy the riches that there are in the world. And so the conversations that we have in our classrooms have to be about what is it that lets us see people having all of these riches and and it not being accessible to others um, in regards to that. Because I think we all would love to, like I said, live in a mansion, drive the fancy cars, to be able to go to games and golf and all those other things. But we don't have that because there's this need for there to be maids. There's this need for there to be garbage collectors. There's this need for all those things in the world. And so the systemic system that's in place is there to keep other people happy. So that they go to their hotel, they get the, the beds changed. And so we have to talk about those things. We have to bring voice to all those things that really matter when it comes to um, making sure that we all can have equal access to the things that are there. Um, I wrote down a couple of different things that I, I really wanna talk about and that 
we need to know that inclusion does not mean exclusive. It doesn't mean that we are not allowing people to be at the table um, who are already at the table. There's so much fear that if we have these conversations around diversity and inclusion, that it means that, oh, that must mean that there is reverse discrimination or that I'm going to be um, pushed out. This is not about pushing out. This is about bringing on and adding to and helping people to recognize that we all should have that right to be there. And the last thing I would talk about that we have to have in these difficult dialogues at all times is that we need to recognize what white fragility is. And we need to recognize what other things that are at play that, that stop people from having their voices. I heard people today um, talk a little bit about what those, those um, barriers are that, in front of, that are in front of uh, people who are minoritized. And we need to talk about that and why those fears that people may have from communities that have access um, and what that looks like because they're fearful that somebody's gonna come in and take that away from them. So I wanna stop now and let's, let's get to our question and answer period because I think it's really important to hear the voices. But I just want you to know that coming from a space where um, I want to be recognized for my humanity and I believe that every single last person has the right to be listened to and heard for their humanity. And that's what's gonna help change the culture and change the voices um, at the table. And so thank you. Thank you, Dr. Butler. Cynthia, would you like to open the, uh, the, the forum for questions and answers at this point? Yes, thank you, um, Albert, um, Ed. Um, so we have, um, this has been so informative and I know for myself, I will probably, I'm, I'm thankful that this is being recorded because I know that there are a lot of things that I want to kind of go back to later on with this, um, with our, our panelists. And so we, um, so um, I'm going to take questions and, um, and so that we can get some answers um, discussed today. And so, um, so if you, just a little bit of instruction. So we're going to do two things. You can put your, your question um, in the chat. Or if you want to, if you want to say something, also put that in the chat and then I'll, you know, be able to kind of call on you just so that we are a little bit orderly. But we do have our first question that's come in already that I'll go through. And this is for Rebecca Pinard. May, um, and this is from Eric. Um, you know, you made um, a, a very prog um, interesting point that at some point diversity of thought leads or at least can lead to oppression. I would be interested to hear more. How does you, how do you define the point at which diversity of thought leads to oppression? At what point does regulation of diversity of thought or at least the expression of thought become necessary? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I think it can lead to oppression once power is involved with it, right? And that's usually where um, how oppression comes about, right? When we think about policies, and laws that are developed, there are individuals behind it. And there are individuals that have specific thoughts and specific ways of thinking. Um, and when you have the power to make decisions for other people based on who they are, that's when oppression occurs. So when we think about institutions of higher education being a space to, um, to really cultivate the knowledge base and thoughts of students who are gonna be future leaders in various industries, we have an important um, form of education to do with our students who are gonna be lead, leading our countries, right? And, and leading these industries um, where you're gonna be holding power in some form of another and have the ability to shape these industries that you're leading, shape, uh, shape teams that you're leading. Um, so that's where it's important to really think about these things, right? And, it's, and, and thought can't be absent of fact. And so when we think about uh, historical legacies and we think about um, the, the history of our country, there are important facts to keep in mind. And so our thoughts should be shaped on facts also, right? So that's where we also have an important role in higher education to think about the facts that we provide to, to, to our student population and form your thoughts based on that, right? But we have to be able to, to provide um, this really hard concrete evidence of, of information and, and really being able to share knowledge that sometimes our students 
aren't privy to before coming to us, right? And so thinking about our responsibility in that way. So that's what I mean in terms of thought potentially leading to oppression if you have the power for your thought to um, influence experience of others. Thank you so much, Rebecca. We have um, another person who wants to verbalize um, their question, um, Vitus Emmanuel. You can unmute yourself and ask your question or make your comment. Hello, um, my name is Vitus Emmanuel. Uh, my question is <clears throat> in regard to, to the age of the of internet, the age of internet and how it affects um, uh, the teaching in academic setting. Uh, for example, people that are into political science and law and all that, I see that it's becoming very challenging because the internet is becoming like a new academic setting of its own. And when people bring that to the academic setting into the classroom, I, I get very worried and concerned about how the future of academics is gonna look like. Because uh, there's a difference between internet and the academic setting. And so, when I listened to the second speaker, I was like, okay, I'm glad I'm listening to this uh, speech he's giving because I have that concern all the time. In fact, sometimes I have to switch cl uh, class. I register to a class and then my first concern is always there, or always that, you know, to see whether this professor allow these kind of things to happen, you know. I, I expect the academic setting to be about facts, not about you know ideology, like he's talking about conservatism and um, socialism and liberalism. You know, what do you do when a, a student, you know, want to know something, the facts about you know a, an ideology, and then. And that student asks a question about ideology and based on the textbook, and somebody bring their, their opinion where they have from political rally or whatever they believe, uh, let's say liberalism or socialism, you know, and somebody bring whatever they think that is what that is and want to link it to what is being taught in the classroom and it contradicts what is in the textbook. And sometimes when that kind of thing is allowed by the professor, what do you do? Okay, so um, that, that question could go to um, any one of our panelists. How do you, and the way I understand it, um, Vitus, is that you're asking, how do you, how does a professor kind of balance between the personal in terms of what a student brings and what you're learning within the classroom. That's kind of what I also kind of heard. Yes. So, um, it, okay, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Okay. I think it's really important for us to recognize that life is really what's in the textbook. And so I, I'm actually pretty impressed with where our society can go with regards to our new technology. You know, I was one of the ones and that was back in the past kicking and screaming about technology, right? When we went from vinyl to CDs and when we went from VHS to DVRs and DVDs and things along those lines. Uh, but if you allow yourself to kind of to learn and to be a lifelong learner and understand that things are going to change that we're not gonna have uh, physical phones anymore in our houses, we're gonna have cell phones. Um, we start to embrace that society has changed. But one of the things I love the most about the fact that we have technology and we have the ability to go on the internet and we have the ability to videotape things on our phones is that it now brings to light some of the things that many people had the opportunity to deny before in the past. And so it actually helps the conversation um, that eight minutes and 46 seconds that took the life of George Floyd um, helped to change the narrative. It's one of the reasons why we might be on this call today, because those things 
are have recognized in the lives of individuals that there are things happening. There are stories that are that are happening that are true that I have been denied access to. Right? People grow up and they learn who they are and they learn racist behaviors. They learn how to discriminate from their life experiences. And so as a multiculturalist, what I say is that those things that are happening in the community or those things that are happening in the world, they help to kind of inform the textbook across curriculums. And if we can talk about that and talk about how people's lives are affected by the things that are happening day to day, that might help us in terms of what we do with our policies and what we do with anything that's going on in the world with relation to how we see other people. People now get to touch people in a different way and experience that they're not as scary as what maybe someone told them in the past. And so we have to embrace our technology and we have to also learn because it's not just about what's in the classroom that a, one person may have created in the, a curriculum for you to read a book, but that's not the only book that's out there. There are so many things that are out there that are informing us about the world and about how we can kind of bring to bear those things that we want to change because we are listening and we have access to a variety of information. We have to be more discerning about where that information takes us. But the access to it is probably a phenomenal thing that we can kind of build upon. I think you're on mute. Can't hear you. Okay, I can't. I, I am on mute. Um, what do you, um, this is a question from Eileen Rothschild. What do you think when we, uh, we and this is for all of our panelists, uh, what do you think when we use euphorism or political correct speech to change attitudes and expectations? We have indeed changed many of the terms and labels for the field of mental illness and disabilities. What are your thoughts in terms of bringing changes to the field of disability to recognize their um, humanity? And this could be a question for, I was thinking about Rebecca um, to answer this particular question, if you don't mind. Yeah, I have, I have problems with euphemisms because it doesn't allow us to really think about the, um, the work that needs to happen. Um, Eileen, if you if you can write a chat, you know if you, if you have examples of what you're referring to as it relates to um, mental illness and disabilities, you, but I can say it if you want. Yeah, yeah, please. Well, I'm a disability rights believer advocate, being in that field. I think many people online are, and I was listening very closely because we use that word inclusion as our be all right now, education and special ed. So I was listening carefully about, are you going to include people with disability? And I think one thing that has made the difference in several decades now is our use of words, our terms. Words matter, people first. Again, anyone who teaches psychology or education know what I'm talking about. And I'm just, um, I, I think more from the first speaker who provoked a lot of my uh, thinking, is um, how meaningful or not. I personally think it did help to change when we're careful about our speech where we value the person first. But again, you know, looking at all the areas of diversity, where is the, where are some of your thoughts on that? You know, and I, I think it's interesting also with, with, with disability. I think it's one of the few when we talk about identity, we'll, we'll, lead, we'll, we'll uh, list everything like race, gender, and oftentimes people say disability as opposed to ability status, right? And, and what that ends up doing is it puts the focus once again on the oppressed group in that sense, those with a disability, as opposed to um, those of us with, that are able-bodied to not even think about our privileges in that. So that's one of the things I've noticed also just in the use of language in that way, how disability is one of the few where we actually talk about ability and, and and uh, the privileges of being able to body that many of us kind of take for granted on, on a daily basis. Um, but yeah, I think, I think you, you can't solve the issue. You can't work towards whatever issue you're trying to deal with if you can't name it. Um, and that is my, my issue with, with euphemisms. That's my issue with talking about 
microaggressions, right? Um, and you know, often when I when I talk about that, I just say microaggression is another form of oppression, right? Whether it's a racial microaggression, gender microaggression, right? It's it's racism in another way. It's sexism in another way. It's it's homophobia in another way. Um, so I think we have to have the 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 courage to call things out on what it is, right? And by being able to do that, that's how we work to really better the systems that we're working towards and really think about improving the conditions for people. But um, by trying to soften language in order to make people feel comfortable, we're really not doing anything helpful in that regard. Um, so yeah, so I'm all about <laughs> removing the euphemisms as, as much as possible. Okay. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, we have another question from Masila Martins. Um, the question is for Kent Butler, Dr. Butler. When you mention our systemic system that makes some happy and others don't regarding the equal access, regarding the equal access this was it, um, to people who don't have them, can you elaborate a little bit more on your views and do you have a solution to this unfairness or in, um, inequality? Would that be a socialist view? I really liked your view, but now seems a little harder um, um, of us to accomplish economic equality due to COVID, we have uh, a major setback. Yeah, um, my view, I would not label it as socialist. Um, what I would label it as is humanism and, and us treating people fairly and, and, and allowing everyone's narrative to be a part of the story. So. For me, it becomes really important that we start to have places at the table available, right? And so this is fear that happens when we talk about bringing diversity. So the president's cabinet at your university should have a wide variety of individuals on there who are qualified. I'm not saying just throw people up there, right? This is conversation that's going on today in the in political system about who is going to be on President Biden's cabinet. And, and it's not about having people who aren't qualified, but opening the door to the fact that we have implicit biases. And our implicit biases, when we have opportunities to hire individuals or to bring students on, all those things come into play in, in a lot of decision-making that goes on, right? So it's truth to the matter that someone's name and name alone may stop them from getting in the door. Not knowing anything about that individual, not allowing that person to even have a say so that you can see their intelligence, see their abilities um, is a part of, of what the hiring practice should be or when you admit a student into your, into your roles in your school. And so it is important that we start to recognize that in order for America to be what it says that it was supposed to be, a land for all, um, and that we, we would have the freedom to be able to go after what it is that we would want to have in our lives, as long as we're not harming and hurting other individuals, that is really what I'm looking for. And so what happens a lot of times is we get distracted when we start hearing words like socialism or other things that are out there, when somebody is just looking to have their own space in the world. And so what I'm asking for is not a, a, a full-fledged, let's automatically take every white individual out of this office and bring in diversity. What I'm saying is we need to be mindful of when we are bringing people into these opportunities that we are looking at others and making sure that their voices are being heard as well. And so that's kind of where I stand on, on terms of us having a more equitable access um, to all things in the world. Um, and, and we need to have conversations around that. The fear has been in this build up is that we it's taboo to talk about race and culture and ethnicity and religion and power and all those other things, because if we do that in mixed, uh, mixed company, that um, there's some type of explosion that's going to occur. No, it's reality. And we need to talk about why my reality is not the same as somebody who looks different to me. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna give this question to the next question um, to Dr. Esmanova. Um, um, academia is or is not about the pursuit of research through the scientific method, which involves making conjectures, um, diverging predictions from them as a logical consequences. 
and then carrying out experiments or empirical observations based on those predictions. How can you effectively do that when you build barriers to freedom of speech? Oh, you're on mute. Okay, uh, well, that's exactly what I was trying to say that we need to endorse the right to be wrong in order to experiment, in order to advance science. But then I, I, I uh, immediately would agree with actually Ken Butler, who says, uh, if I understand well, let's not allow one voice to dominate because for experimentation, we need the diversity of voices. We don't have to postulate which voices count, but we have to make sure that there is not one or two which dominate. So it is not that we need to allow the correct voices. We just need a plurality of voices and, and to be very cautious not to, um, you know, create privileges within that diversity. Indeed, otherwise, it's indeed the end of science and the end of learning. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, next question. Um, this is from Valentine. Um, the discussion is very interesting and critical, and to achieve progress, there must be understanding between people. Given the fact that many people only consume media that supports their viewpoint and are increasingly less interested in the beliefs of the, the other side, not just religious, Furthermore, this is a question that requires the mass of people to be included in the discussion, but many lack education and critical thinking that are required to achieve our goal. And um, quite frankly, the, uh, the, the lack that will will to do it. How can we combat this? And so I, I think this is a really good question for each of our, um, into our, our experts here. So um, Kent, you wanna take a stab at it? <laughs> Me first, huh? Okay. Yes. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I will say this. Um, it's important. It's very, very important to recognize that those voices that we are not allowing to um, kind of be at the table tell, tell us that there's a fear. There's a fear that we are um, dealing with that doesn't allow those things to happen, right? So I think the way that we combat it is that we, we talk about it. We open the door to difficult dialogues around race and culture, ethnicity, um, politics. Um, we live this every day. Every day, the things that we decide and how we, how we make decisions is based on things that we're not supposed to bring to work or bring to the classroom, yet, that's how we govern our lives, right? So those people who are watching all day Fox News, all day MSNBC, all day CNN, um, or you know, listening in on NPR um, and things along those lines, they also have to recognize, and we have to help them to recognize that they can just also be open to hearing other points of view. My role, and, and Jack Simons can speak to this, I'm not here to change anybody. I'm only here to expose. And what I want to in that exposure is give you the opportunity to start using your own critical thinking skills about what, what is happening here. How have I benefited? How has so-and-so not benefited? And is that fair? Is that something that we, we, should, we should be really dealing with and talking about? It happens in the, in the store when I go into a store and someone says, um, a little kid looks up at me and says, hey, mommy, it's a black guy. And the mother quickly goes, no, 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 don't say that. Now, who's embarrassed? Is it me? I'm not embarrassed. I know I walked out the door. I knew I was a black guy when I walked out the door. Was it me that was embarrassed or was it the parent? Because they did not want to deal with the fact that, oh, my God, we're not supposed to see culture. We're not supposed to see race. We're not supposed to talk about that. But it's here. So why aren't we talking about it? Because someone back in the day said it's taboo to talk about all these things that affect our lives. And so we have to now step back and say, we're not gonna allow that to take over. We're going to talk about these things. We're gonna recognize these things. Because I believe that if you allow others to touch you and hear their story, you'll be able to move forward. 
we get affected by things only when it kind of touches us, right? So if cancer comes into our family or if somebody is dealing with COVID or whatever have you, we can distance ourselves any other time, but when it really affects us is when we start to think differently and let other people touch you so that you can grow and learn to think differently. Dr. Asmanova, you want to um, give us your opinion about how do we combat this? Yes, um, I, I fear that the university is trying to compensate for something that the state is not doing. Uh, in a very uh, beautiful uh, sentence, actually, uh, Rebecca Pinar said the university is becoming a home, but it's becoming a home because of social disintegration. So the university is becoming a, play, a home and a place for skill building uh, rather than a place for experimentation and, and creativity uh, and advancement of science because it is compensating for the disintegration of society with, with this rampant capitalism uh, that is uh, um, you know, not creating jobs and creating poverty, inequality, exclusion. So we, we engage in the shortcuts of sending the police to schools and, and the speech police to universities. The univer the, so, so the problem is not in the university, the problem is in, in, in our societies. So we need to train our students to fight the roots of, of the problem and to uh, create more progressive social policies and economic policies. Uh, the university cannot compensate for social disintegration forever. This is from me. Thank you. Um, um, Rebecca, do you want to give your um, opinion about how do we combat this? Yeah, and just kind of piggyback on the idea of, of capitalism. You know, unfortunately, institutions, a lot of us are tuition driven, right? So we have to think about what's going to keep us going and staying afloat. And oftentimes, because of that, our values waver based on what's going to ensure that we have our, our, our students coming back and or that we don't meet, you know, make it to, to the headlines. And I think it's important that as an institution, if we have certain mission and values that we, that we stay focused on that and, and, and we, we keep in line with that. Um, and part of it does mean being able to have space to create these conversations, right? So having more opportunities to engage in these ways um, and to show the brilliance of students by engaging in these conversations, right? Um, but at the same time, being able to do so in, in spaces that allow for care for one another, right? Whenever I, I lead meetings or workshops, we start with the ground rules and we have that. So we know that there's an understanding of why we're here and regard, regardless of differences of opinions, our values as to why we're here are probably all the same. And how do we stay focused on that and having that space to, to be able to do that? Um, so, you know, I do think that a lot of it is offering up more of these opportunities to engage without the fear of what might come from it in terms of our financial <laughs> security as institutions, right? And, and, and the attainment of tuition dollars and things like that, but really being able to stay true to that need to engage, to, um, to elevate the discourse to our students, while also being able to um, model for our students how to do so in a safe environment. Okay. Um, I'm looking at time. Um, and we have about two, four minutes. Um, so I wanna try to get to as many questions as possible. Um, so uh, we have another one. It kind of sounded like many of the things that was for you, Rebecca, but it seems like you were kind of answering that person's question um, a little bit. Um, and then we have another question from um, Salia Bava. Speaking of naming issues, um, how might we name the purpose of education today? Is it about the thought and speech, about transfer of knowledge, co-creating understanding, a means to end, a luxury, a task making space, a place for discourse and experimentation? What is our purpose today as um, to be continued to build on the pre-existing system that was built on limiting access and thought? So this could um, go open to, I, I'm kind of curious about um, what um, Dr. Esmanova uh, perspective on this particular question is. Oh, you're on mute. What, you're on mute.
Okay. Yeah. Um, actually, that formulation is is, is very uh, well um, phrased. Uh, university can be a place for all of this, but for me, it is above all for experimentation in a disciplined way in order to advance our understanding and our capacity to deal with the world. So the experimentation I would put in the first place. Everything else will follow. Okay, thank you. Another question, and this could go to um, Dr. Butler. Do you think group projects, and this is from Dr. Regina Gibson, do you think group projects should be discouraged or encouraged because of the potential arguments resulting from divorce points of view? Um, and I kind of want to hear this answer too. <laughs> I believe it should be encouraged and there should be um, ground rules and ex expectations of your students um, in order to do so. I think it's really important that we start to socialize individuals and understand, I guess I shouldn't use that word. Um, we should really help students to learn to communicate and deal with one another. So we need to set up ground rules and talk about what that's like. When they have disappointments or disagreements, they should be able to communicate those and work through those types of things. A lot of times what has happened in these group projects is that one person takes the lead and somebody else falters and somebody doesn't do their part. And then they don't, we don't teach them how to have that conversation around how they should be doing this as a team. And so we need to start working on those types of things. And those things that are hard, we need to find ways to help make them better. Not, we, we know that we send students into these types of situations where they are not going to be honest with one another and they're not gonna treat one another um, with respect in these group situations. Then we have to be there to kind of support helping them work through it and understand how to do it because it has not been taught to us or many students how to, to operate within a group situation. And so we have to be able to, to help them because that's what learning is and that's how we send them out into the world because if they can't work in a group project together in a classroom, how are they going to do that in their work environment when they go out and, and hope and help make changes in the world? Thank you so much. So we are about we are at time, but I recognize that there are a lot of great questions in the chat. And so I apologize if we were not able to get to them, but I want to respect everyone's time. And so next we're going to have Sarah Hahn, Dr. Sarah Hahn, um, with closing statements. Okay, so uh, I first wanna take the time to really thank our panelists and our audience today for coming out. Uh, conversations like this are not possible if people are not willing to have them or listen to them. So I'm gonna keep my remarks brief just because I know we're running a little bit out of time, but I just wanted to summarize points that really resonated with me and then kind of leave us all with questions on where to go next. So with Dr. Asmanova, she talked about historically, uh, even within the university system, free speech has been used as a weapon. But now we're seeing this kind of shift, more of a dilemma where free speech is turning into safe speech. So safe speech appears on some level to help those who have been marginalized. But at its core, we're seeing that the proper use of free speech is to is to fight oppression, is to protect cultures, and to further this idea of diversity. Dr. Asmanova also talks about who is to decide what is right and what is wrong, and if safe speech is going to lead us to policing our conversations and our thoughts. And so we really need to use free speech to expose bigotry and always question and always debate one another. Ms. Matisse Pinard talks about the expectations of organizations to always discuss diversity, but she questioned, what does that even mean? So we'll use diversity to talk about the isms, racism, sexism, but we're not really talking about the harm it has caused, uh, just because it just becomes this encompassing idea. So we really need to take the time to look at the socio-political and historical context of diversity. We need to question the barriers when it, uh, we talk about diversity of thought, especially, and we need to question the larger impact that it's going to have. So she mentions that, you know, we never question who created the institutions we teach at or the policies or the curriculum we use. Um, while we're also at the same exact time trying to change and shift while relying on the work of people who have never been, um, you never had to endure a legacy of oppression. So in order to develop these future leaders, we really need to understand not only diversity of thought, but the oppression of thought. 
Then we ended with Dr. Kent Butler, who discussed how we need to really actively listen to one another. And we need to humanize one another as well when it comes to diversity of thought. So speaking our truth can come at a cost, but it needs to be done. So in order to have these conversations, we need to be real. You know, we need to learn and observe from everyone and everything. He mentions that when we talk about free speech, we have to realize it impacts us every single day and the inclusion of multiple voices for multiple stories for free speech is how we're going to make the change. It's important that it's not just in the classroom, uh, but also in our industries as well. And we really need to question and dismantle racist ties that help people stay in power. And remember that inclusion does not mean exclusion. However, uh, even though I surely this is all so amazing and intriguing and really, again, I thank our panelists, but if this isn't followed by action, what do, what do these thoughts even mean? So for all of us today, our panelists, Mercy College faculty, the staff and students who are joining us, I'm gonna leave you with kind of three large questions, thoughts and actions. So one, how do we create an inclusive campus climate that has institutional commitment to promoting student body diversity, but it doesn't alienate people in our understanding of history? Two, what can we do to ensure opportunities for all people while being aware of what Eduardo talks about as this public persona in our private beliefs. And finally, three, what can we do to facilitate this conversation and further it to an audience who probably or might not be here today? So I leave you all with that. Thank you, Sarah, for those uh, excellent concluding remarks. And thank you, everybody. This has uh, been extremely informative and I'm glad we were able to have it. Uh, without, and um, at this point, I'd like to wish you all a, a wonderful rest of your day and Albena, a lovely evening as you're in Europe. Thank you again for, for joining and uh, thanks to Mercy College and everybody for allowing these conversations to happen. Have a lovely day.